Have you ever wondered about the causes of pilot fatigue or how to recognize the signs of fatigue in yourself and others or about the regulations and guidelines for flight and duty time limitations to prevent fatigue? If that's you, then you're going to want to tune into this episode because Dr. Victor Vogel will be joining us here today to talk about what pilots need to know about fatigue, and that's coming up right after the news. Hello, my name is Max Trescott. I've been flying for 50 years. I'm the author of several books and also the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. And my mission is to help you be the safest possible pilot. If you're new to the show, take a moment right now and touch either the subscribe key or if you're using the Apple Podcast app, the follow key so that next week's episode is downloaded for free. And if you didn't hear last week's episode in which Jonathan Fay talked about being the victim of a laser attack and how he fought back, check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 296. Coming up on the news for the week of October 16th, 2023, ForeFlight enables a new emergency guidance feature, a pilot gets prison time for lying to the FAA, and a pilot says gunfire preceded his balloon crash. All this and more, and the news starts now. From AOPA.org, ForeFlight enables emergency guidance. ForeFlight subscribers will be able to get detailed engine out instructions and view them on a 3D map as a result of an upgrade to the popular aviation app demonstrated at the NBAA convention in Las Vegas. The engine out procedures are easier to conceptualize in 3D, said Sam Taylor, ForeFlight technical marketing specialist, who showed off some of the enhancements the company has developed for business aviation. He said, our runway analysis has been expanded to include about 80% of the aircraft models in the business aviation fleet. Separately, for flight upgrades for corporate flight departments, allow them to monitor company flights around the world as they happen, customize aircraft reserve fuel policies, and log flights electronically. From FlyingMag.com, the NTSB preliminary report is out on the Kentucky fatal crash. The NTSB has released its preliminary findings on the fatal crash of a Piper Cherokee in Kentucky involving a flight instructor and private pilot candidate on a night flight. You may recall that we talked about that crash two weeks ago in episode 295 with Catherine Cavagnaro. The event received national attention because the 22-year-old CFI made several social media posts during the flight that included demeaning comments about the 18-year-old student pilot. He also posted an image of approaching thunderstorms along the route of flight and continued toward them. What's new that we learned in this report is it says that the pilot contacted ATC at 10.44 p.m. and the controller advised the flight of heavy to extreme precipitation at the aircraft's 9 o'clock position, roughly northwest of the planned route. ADSB data showed the plane continued its course and about two minutes later, the CFI requested an IFR clearance. The controller issued the clearance and assigned a turn to the east to get out of the weather. The CFI advised ATC that the aircraft was, quote, getting blown around like crazy. The airplane's flight track showed a turn to the northwest, followed by a right circling turn. The controller reiterated the heading of 090 degrees. The CFI replied that they were in, quote, pretty extreme turbulence. The flight track showed a continuing descending turn to the right. There were no further communications. The last ADSB position was recorded at 10.49 p.m. at an altitude of 2,200 feet. The wreckage, described by the NTSB as a debris field, was spread over 25 acres in a hilly, densely wooded area. From WSET.com, pilot exposed to carbon monoxide in Virginia plane crash in February 2022. According to the final NTSB report, the pilot was exposed to carbon monoxide from undetected engine exhaust in the cockpit. This caused the pilot to lose control of the plane within minutes of takeoff. The NTSB says the pilot was a 23-year-old man, this flight was his first solo flight for the company he was working for, and I'll talk more about this accident during my updates. From AviationSourceNews.com, the FAA's Office of Special Investigations, or OSI, takes aim at aircraft laser pointer incidents. The surge in laser pointer incidents aimed at aircraft is a concerning trend that poses significant risk to aviation safety. And of course, we talked about one of those incidents last week in episode 296. The OSI is actively working to combat the issue, emphasizing the importance of real-time reporting, effective communication, and public awareness. According to the FAA, reported incidents of laser strikes on aircraft rose by 41% in 2021, the highest numbers on record. To combat the growing threat of laser incidents, OSI officials stress the importance of real-time reporting and rapid response from all agencies and law enforcement, 
both within the U.S. and overseas. Timely reporting is a key strategy in addressing these incidents as it allows for swift action to be taken. Individuals who engage in such dangerous activities may face substantial fines with penalties reaching up to $250,000 and imprisonment for up to five years. Since 2010, a total of 244 injuries have been reported, underscoring the escalative and pervasive threat. The nearly 9,500 laser strikes reported to the FAA in 2022 highlight the severity of the growing concern. From Syracuse.com, pilot sentenced to prison for lying to FAA. A 72-year-old Fayetteville, New York man was sentenced to federal prison for lying on an FAA form to renew his pilot's license. The man, Noah Felice, has had a colorful history that includes saying he was rescued by aliens after a fatal plane crash. He also lied on a pistol permit, made up a residency to run for town judge, and lost his private investigator's license for repeatedly lying. U.S. District Court Judge Sotheby sentenced Felice to one month in prison and three years of supervised release. Prosecutors said Felice in 2017 failed to report four misdemeanor convictions and that he was receiving medical disability benefits. At the time he was getting a disability check, the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs said for post-traumatic stress disorder. Felice was charged with making a false report in 2022. According to his lawyer, quote, his pilot's license has been revoked. He has no intentions of ever flying a plane again. He only wants to live out his last days in peace. Felice once claimed a beam of light caused him to crash a plane. He was flying over the Pacific Ocean in 1980. That crash killed his cousin, and Felice later told the History Channel that he was rescued by aliens. He later moved to central New York and was convicted in 2010 for lying about his criminal history on a pistol permit. He also ran around that time for town judge's seat in Oswego County by setting up what appeared to be a phony home address. He dropped out of that race after the Post Standard published a story about his residency. In other news headlines, electric aviation startup Beta Technologies unveiled the first aircraft charging station in Massachusetts at the Marshfield Municipal Airport. Beta also brought one of its experimental Alia electric planes to Marshfield to demonstrate the charging station. Beta is building a network of more than 60 charging stations at airports along the East Coast and Gulf Coast. And Colorado officials are pondering their next moves after the private company that has been developing the airport's experimental remote air traffic control tower announced this week that it was terminating its work on the facility. As Rob Mark reported in episode 292, Sea Ridge Technologies was operating the remote tower at KFNL, the Northern Colorado Regional Airport. The state is committed to resolving the issue, as it has already spent about $8.8 billion on the project. And EAA, the Experimental Aircraft Association, says the number of amateur-built fatal accidents dropped by 28% compared to the previous year. Also, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has completely overhauled its online weather site for pilots, and you may want to check it out at aviationweather.gov. And Denver, Colorado-based electric aircraft developer Bi Aerospace announced it has signed four letters of intent from prominent aviation training providers for a total of 340 of their eFlyer aircraft. Their website says, quote, as of mid-2023, we have over $1 billion in customer backlog value. And if you'd like to know more about Bi Aerospace, check out our episode 160, in which we interviewed the company president. And finally, in the news from avweb.com, Pilot says gunfire preceded gas balloon crash. A pilot competing in the Gordon Bennett Cup long distance balloon race said gunfire led to the crash of his balloon into a high voltage power line last week. Two teammates were piloting the Poland Team 1 balloon after taking off from the Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta. According to race organizers, the pilots ran into trouble while passing over the Dallas Fort Worth airspace at an altitude of 12,000 feet before beginning a descent. One of the pilots told a local news station he heard what sounded like automatic gunfire before he began an emergency descent to avoid getting shot. Unfortunately, the gas balloon hit a high-voltage power line, causing it to explode before falling to the ground. Both pilots were taken to the hospital. Balloon Fiesta officials said, quote, Both are experienced gas balloon pilots who have logged significant time in gas balloons. Our thoughts are with the gentlemen, their families, and friends for a full and complete recovery. This was the 66th Gordon Bennett gas balloon race, in which competitors aimed to fly the farthest distance. On Wednesday, the race concluded with Team France 2 winning first place. Well, that's news for this week. Coming up next, a few of my updates. And then later, we'll talk with Victor Vogel about pilot fatigue, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. (laughs) 
And now for a few updates. First, congratulations to my friend Ed Waters, who writes that he did his 100th Cirrus G6 factory delivery training event in Knoxville. He said he finished up flying with a customer to home in New Hampshire. These are three-day training events for people who buy new aircraft. And I've done some of these, and they're great fun. So, Ed, congratulations. And I want to mention briefly that this is a listener-supported show. And after we talk about this upcoming carbon monoxide accident, I'll tell you about ways that you can help support this show and about ways to help keep you safe from carbon monoxide poisoning. Now let's talk more about the carbon monoxide accident that I mentioned during the news. The final NTSB report was recently released, and I'd like to share part of it with you. We'll be talking about fatigue in a few minutes with Dr. Victor Vogel, and I found something interesting in the witness statements, which are not part of the final report, but which are included in a docket of files related to the accident. After the accident, the NTSB interviewed a woman that the pilot was dating, and the interviewer wrote, quote, I inquired the last time she heard from the pilot the night before his flight, and she said that he had texted her at 1.30 a.m., however, she had been asleep. She assumed that he texted when he got back to his hotel room after visiting his aunt. And in a separate interview with the assistant to the FBO manager, he stated that the pilot arrived at the airport at 8.15 a.m. Now, if you were to estimate that after waking up, it took him perhaps 45 minutes to dress, eat, and get to the airport, that means that he got at most six hours of sleep that night. Now, fatigue is not mentioned in the final report, but what that report does say is that the probable cause was, quote, the pilot's impairment due to exposure to carbon monoxide as a result of undetected engine exhaust penetration into the cockpit, resulting in the pilot's failure to maintain a minimal controllable airspeed after partially securing an engine after takeoff. Now, here are more details. On February 1st, 2022, at 10.06 a.m. Eastern Time, the Cessna 310R airplane, November 622 Quebec Tango, was destroyed when it was involved in an accident near Danville, Virginia. The commercial pilot was fatally injured. The airplane was operated as a Part 91 aerial surveying flight. According to another company pilot, he and the accident pilot arrived at the Danville Regional Airport in Virginia, conducted their flight planning together, and completed the pre-flight inspections of their respective airplanes. They then taxied their airplanes to runway 2 for engine run-up and surveying computer startup. During the taxi and engine run-up, the accident airplane was heading 196 degrees true, the company pilot estimated that the accident pilot was on that heading for about 8 to 10 minutes while they completed these pre-departure tasks. The company pilot departed first, and the accident pilot departed several minutes later. ADSB data showed that the airplane departed the airport and turned toward the southeast. Shortly after takeoff, the airplane's climb rate decreased from 1,200 feet per minute to about 500 feet per minute, and the airplane's acceleration stopped. The airplane reached an altitude of about 2,600 feet MSL about two minutes into the flight and began a 10-degree bank angle left turn at an airspeed of 136 knots. About 10 seconds after turning left, the airplane returned to wings level and then rolled right at a rate of about 3 degrees per second while descending at a rate of more than 1,000 feet per minute. The last estimated bank angle was over 60 degrees to the right. The airplane impacted a wooded area about 4 nautical miles from the airport. Post-accident examination of the wreckage revealed that the left fuel tank selector handle was in the off position, the left throttle was near idle, the left propeller control was near the feather position, and the rudder was trimmed to the right. These control positions were consistent with the left engine being partially secured, which would result in a lack of power and the loss of climb rate noted shortly after takeoff. Additionally, the right fuel tank selector handle was found in the left main fuel tank position. The examination of both engines revealed no evidence of any pre-impact anomalies or malfunctions that would have precluded normal operation, and no reason for why the pilot might have partially secured the left engine. The pilot had 85 hours of flight experience in the same make and model of the accident airplane, and I read elsewhere that he had, I think, about 500 hours total. The accident flight was his first solo aerial surveying flight for the company, following several observation flights with the company's owner. The airplane was equipped with an adhesive disposable spot carbon monoxide detector. In the presence of CO, the spot would turn gray or black, and the spot would return to normal color after it was exposed to fresh air. The Virginia Department of Forensic Science performed toxicological testing of postmortem blood from the pilot. Carboxyhemoglobin, a marker of CO exposure, was elevated at 31%. After the accident, 
electronic CO detectors were installed in the operator's fleet. Research was conducted by the operator at the investigator's request to determine if the engine exhaust could penetrate the cockpit under the specific conditions that were present on the day of the accident. Following that test, the pilot wrote, quote, Once I got into the run-up area, I angled the airplane close to an east-northeast orientation to put the breeze off my right quartering tail based on the grass and other indicators. Almost immediately, I noticed the audible alarm on the CO detector going off. I looked over and could see the number on the CO detector rising through the 50 to 60 ppm range. It quickly rose above 100 ppm within the 17 seconds of the video. At the time, I was unaware what level would be harmful. I shut the video off so I could focus on clearing the cabin air. The number eventually climbed up to around 150 to 160 ppm before finally coming back down. There were very minor exhaust odors present during the high readings. Following this research, the operator noted that if the cabin heater had been on on the day of the accident when outside temperatures were 33 degrees Fahrenheit, the heater fan would have drawn in air at the ventilation inlet on the front of the nose. This would have pushed the exhaust into the cabin. On December 20, 2021, the NTSB called on the FAA a second time to require carbon monoxide detectors in GA aircraft. In June of 2004, the NTSB issued safety recommendation A0428 to the FAA to require installation of CO detectors in all single-engine airplanes with forward-mounted reciprocating engines. The FAA declined to require detectors and instead recommended the GA airplane owners and operators install them on a voluntary basis. The FAA also recommended exhaust system inspections and muffler replacements at intervals they believed would address equipment failure before they led to CO poisoning. Because the FAA did not require installations of CO detectors, safety recommendation A428 was classified by the NTSB as, quote, closed, unacceptable action. On January 20th, 2022, NTSB recommendation A221 called on the FAA to require that all enclosed cabin aircraft with reciprocating engines be equipped with a carbon monoxide detector that complies with an aviation-specific minimum performance standard with active oral or visual alerting. Additionally, Recommendation A-22-2 called on AOPA to inform their members about the dangers of CO poisoning in flight, encourage them to, one, install CO detectors with active oral or visual alerting, and two, proactively ensure thorough exhaust inspection during regular maintenance. The recommendation identified 31 accidents between 1982 and 2020 attributed to CO poisoning. 23 of those accidents were fatal, killing 42 people and seriously injuring four more. The CO detector was found in only one of the airplanes, and it was not designed to provide an active audible or visual alert to the pilot, features the NTSB recommended in 2004. In each of these accidents, the pilot was not alerted to CO entering the cabin in enough time to counteract the effects of CO poisoning. Now, we've talked a lot about carbon monoxide poisoning on this uh, show, including episodes 88 and episode 90, where we talked about a Mooney pilot who passed out in flight from CO poisoning and survived the resulting crash, and we interviewed him on the show. I'm sure some of you have said, yeah, I think I better buy an active CO detector. And if you haven't, well, here's another opportunity to do that. I have a couple of carbon monoxide detectors that I fly with because research by Mike Bush at avweb.com showed that the stick-on spot detectors, which uh, this particular accident aircraft, what we talked about, was carrying are just very slow to react, which is apparently the case with this accident as well, too. So I'm holding in my hand my SensorCon EV8 Inspector a carbon monoxide monitor, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Also, I've talked about my Delta Zulu Lightspeed headset, which has a built-in carbon monoxide monitor, which I used extensively during my helicopter lessons earlier this year, and which alerted me to carbon monoxide that was coming into the cockpit both on startup and when we had prolonged hovers. And of course, one way to support this show is if you decide to buy a Lightspeed headset, if when you make a purchase from them, you go to their website by first clicking on one of the links that are in our show notes, which you can find in the app that you're using to listen to us now, or by just going out on the web to aviationnewstalk.com. If you start with that link to get to their website, you'll pay the same as you would if you went directly to the website, but Lightspeed will pay us a referral fee to help support the show. So if you don't yet have some form of an electronic carbon monoxide detector, Commit today to getting one sometime soon. And aviation is a very small community, so see if you know any of these people. 
My thanks to Ed Perry, who edited his pledge up to the $50 level, so he's a mega supporter. And also thanks to new Patreon supporters, Michael Iaccini and Brett Denhart. If you'd like to help support the show, it's easy. Just head on out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome and sign up on our Patreon site. Or if you'd like to make a one-time donation, head on out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. Coming up next, our conversation with Dr. Victor Vogel about pilot fatigue, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Now let me tell you a little about Victor Vogel. He's a board-certified medical oncologist who was a medical school professor for 25 years, where he did clinical research in breast cancer treatment and prevention. He's been flying for more than 40 years, and he's a CFI and double I, and a member of the board of directors of the National Association of Flight Instructors. Two years ago, he founded a public charity called Susquehanna STEM to the Skies that seeks to bring aviation-based STEM education to the high schools and career technical centers in the Susquehanna Valley of South Central Pennsylvania. And now here's our conversation with Dr. Victor Vogel. Victor, welcome back to the show. So good to see you again. And it's good to see you, Max. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Well, it's always a pleasure. Hey, you sent me some great reading material, and I learned some new things, a couple of different things. One, that fatigued individuals consistently underreport how tired they are. And another is that we sometimes don't understand our own impairment, and we make more risky decisions as a result of that. Tell us about both of those things. Well, I became intrigued about this whole uh, topic and concept of, of fatigue, both as a pilot and as a flight instructor and, and as a physician. And in my reading, I learned that the um, neurophysiologists, these people that study how the brain works, they identified uh, parts of the brain that are actually impaired when we're fatigued or, or by sleep deprivation. And we have areas of our brain that help us process information and, and make judgments and decisions. But there's also areas in our brains that uh, help us manage risk. And when we're fatigued or sleep deprived, those parts of our brain that alert us to risk and help us to make decisions about risk management, those parts of our brain don't work as well. So they become impaired. So um, not only can we not process information as effectively, but the safeguards that our brains have about uh, being averse to risk don't work as well. So it's, it's actually a, a double threat. Yeah, that's kind of scary to me because I think when we're fatigued, we have poor performance. But this says that essentially we're also taking bigger risk, which just compounds the problem. Yeah, our judgment is impaired and our ability to process information that alerts us to risk may be impaired. So we may not be aware of the risk or as alert to the risk. And then our ability to process and manage the risk is also impaired. So it's a threat at many levels. Yeah. And related to that, uh, the reading said that we also underestimate the consequences of losses. So really, we're caught in a tight squeeze there. We're, we've got poor judgment on the positive side and on the negative side. Yeah. I was surprised to learn that our ability to uh, assess just how severe the outcome might be is impaired. So in, in a situation where we're wide awake, we may look at a risk and say, well, that's not something I want to take on. But when we're uh, fatigued or sleep deprived, uh, then we'll look at something and say, well, the outcome may not be so bad. So uh, the sleep deprivation and fatigue is very bad on many, many levels. Yeah, it sounds like density altitude that affects multiple different things. You know, the engine, the propeller, the wing, and it's all kind of cumulative. Yes. Well, the NTSB said that fatigue is a causal or contributing factor in one out of five accidents. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and that was uh, a bit surprising to me, although there are studies, many of which were done in Europe um, among pilots. And the data from Europe suggests that fatigue it happens very, very often. In, in a study of eight European countries, they found that um, 80% of pilots reported that they had to cope with fatigue while flying, and 50% said that fatigue had impaired their performance uh, while on flight duty. And in a uh, Scandinavian study, 70% of pilots uh, said they made mistakes 
while they were flying because they were fatigued. I remember an incident where in the U.S., uh, there were two pilots in an airliner. I believe they were heading to Chicago, either Midway or Hare, and they fell asleep and actually flew past Chicago for, what was it, 30 or 40 minutes until um, they woke up and ATC had been trying to get them a- awake and, and they alerted them that, hey, fellas, you you missed your destination. And fortunately, they had plenty of fuel and the autopilot was working well. And they woke up and turned around and went to where they were supposed to be going. But that that is a sobering reality to know that there you are with two pilots up front and they both fell asleep and missed the destination. Yeah, and I think it's easy to just assume that this affects mostly airline pilots, people who are required to fly late at night because of their job. And yet, I'm always amazed when I read about general aviation accidents that happen in the wee hours of the morning, often to people who are quite capable. There was a pair of CAP pilots who'd spent all day flying uh, in Nevada, and then they returned. I think they had delivered an airplane. And then they were returning back to California at about two in the morning, and they flew right into the side of an 8,000-foot mountain. The most shocking thing about it was they were flying a G-1000 aircraft where there was terrain capability, which is something I recommend people always have on when they fly at night. And also, I recall a Cirrus accident where somebody had gone up to New York State, picked up their son from college and their friend, brought them down to Virginia, had dinner, of course, a little late getting them back. And it was past one o'clock in the morning when they went to fly an instrument approach. And I think they ended up flying it two or three times, eventually crashing. I think people just don't uh, fully appreciate how poor our performance can be in the wee hours of the morning. Yeah, and we we know this is an issue for the uh, airline pilots that fly demanding schedules where they may be flying sometimes during the day, sometimes at night. But it's also a risk for general aviation pilots because if we think about many of the missions of general aviation pilots, this is often professional people who are working during the day. And at the end of the day, uh, they have to get home. They've been at a meeting and they have to be at work the next day. And so they've worked all day. And, you know, sometimes we think, well, the only fatiguing work is physical labor. You know, the kind we all experience, like when we have to take our child to college and cart all that stuff up three flights of stairs. We know that's fatiguing, but mental work is also fatiguing. And many professionals who are, who are also general aviation pilots can work at a desk or in front of a cute computer screen all day, or like I used to do, going in and out of exam rooms. And it's not physically demanding, but it's, it's mentally demanding. And then we hop in an airplane at five or six in the evening and embark on a two or three hour flight and wonder why uh, it might be a challenge for us to remain alert or stay awake. And I, I think that's a risk that we all need to be aware of. We need to be cautious when we get into an airplane after a long day of work like that and expect to be fully awake and alert um, for a nighttime flight. Yes, a lawyer friend of mine told me that if he has to work a full eight hour day and he's on the road, then he'll bring a CFI along with him for that end of the day uh, type of flight, which makes total sense. Now, you had a story about someone who had a very long day that resulted in an accident. Tell us about that. Well, there's a report several years ago about a um, a flight instructor and one of her students who flew at the end of a very long day. The CFI had, had gone to bed at 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night, but then got up at 12.45 a.m. In other words, in the very late night or the very early morning, depending on how you look at it. And at 1.20 a.m., she was driving to the airport and then flew from Alabama to Florida between 2.30 a.m. and 6.45 a.m. Then she took a nap in the the FBO, slept somewhere, we're not sure, but somewhere between two and four hours. Um, And her student had been attending a meeting in Orlando um, all day before the flight. And they took off from Orlando Executive Airport at about um, just about 10 minutes before eight in in the evening into marginal VFR without a flight plan and did not receive any air traffic control assistance. And somewhere between 9.15 and 9.30 in the evening, they apparently entered IMC conditions and and crashed and, and neither the student nor the CFI survived. So pretty good example of 
long day, long duty hours, flying at night after limited sleep uh, at the end of more than 24 hours of, of work type involvement and, and had a very, very unfortunate outcome. Hmm. Yeah, and one of my personal minimums is I just don't fly after 11 p.m. at night because there are so many things that happen late. And I know even if I'm sitting here in my office working at 11 o'clock at night, yeah, I'm productive, but mm, I'm still not as sharp as I was earlier in the day. I hope this is not too medically physiologic, but there's something called the window of the circadian low. And what in the world does that mean? Well, we have these circadian rhythms, these rhythms where things improve and then they decline and then they improve and then they decline. And not surprisingly, one of those lows occurs between 2 and 6 a.m. And that's probably when most of us are in bed and most of us are getting our, our best sleep. But there's also another dip period which happens between 3 and 5 in the afternoon. And if you've ever worked in an office or an environment where there's other people, you can see the, the folks gathering around the coffee pot at between 3 and 5 right before it's time to go home because we, we get this dip and this droop. And what happens during these dips is that many of the body functions decline. Uh, the things that, that work on a regular basis start to slow down. Things like heart rate and blood pressure, they all decline during this, this time of this circadian low. And so one of the absolute worst times uh, to be flying is in the wee hours uh, between, say, the hours of 2 and 6 or 7 a.m., if you usually spend most of your time awake uh, during the daylight hours. And then this other time, this, this afternoon dip would occur, you know, as we're finishing up our day activities. And it's like we were just speaking about a minute ago, you finish up a day of work or you're at a meeting and then you say, oh, well, now it's time to get in my plane and fly two or three hours home at a time when your body rhythms are once again at their lowest. So, this is something to keep in mind that we have these predictable uh, dips. And one of the things we can do to help that is short naps can actually help. I, I, I'm a, a real fan of uh, Sir Winston Churchill was a, a, a laudable character, but he used to, um, during World War II, um, take a nap in the afternoon and then he would work until midnight. And that afternoon nap would enable him to stay up late and, and deal with all the many pressures uh, of the war. And, and he did this while doing things that I don't recommend, like eating too much and drinking too much. But that afternoon nap got him, you know, kept him alert through the evening hours. And so that's one thing pilots could try to schedule is after a busy day and if they're feeling tired, not a long nap because that disrupts the whole sleep cycle. And we get into something called sleep inertia, where we need even more sleep, more the body wants to sleep more. But short naps, 30, 40 minutes an hour, um, can really revitalize us and get us through those those times when we have these physiologic dips. Yeah, and I see that a lot of FBOs have crew restrooms where they may have very comfortable lounge chairs. Some of them will actually have beds available. And my recommendation would be bring along a sleep mask. Uh, I have found that my sleep has gotten so much better if I can just block out all of the light. And, uh, you know, I think people really ought to be thinking about what are the different things that they can do to optimize their sleep and then just do those things on a regular basis. But let's get back to um, some of the causes of fatigue and the factors that contribute to fatigue in aviation. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, so the causes of fatigue are, are varied and, and they're multiple. As we mentioned, it, it, the time of day certainly makes a difference. Um, so we're obviously more likely to be sleepy in the late evening or, or, or the early night than we are in the in the beginning of the day. And and the amount and, and quanti quality of sleep we get has an impact. And how long has it been since we last slept? So even if you have a very good night's sleep, if you go 17 or 18 or 19 hours without then sleeping again, uh, that can be fatiguing if that time since the last sleep is long. Certainly crossing time zones is, is an issue. In my uh, medical job, I often uh, flew to Europe and sometimes to Asia. And particularly going east is very, very challenging. And it, it can very seriously disrupt those normal rhythms that we've been talking about. It's a list, little less difficult to fly west. I know when I 
came home to the States from Europe, it was less demanding than going to Europe or going to the Middle East or going to Asia. But we have to be aware that even crossing two or three time zones in the U.S. can make a difference. And experts say that the amount of the, the time it takes to adjust to changes in time zones is probably about one day per time zone. So if you go from New York to California, it might take you three days to really readjust all your rhythms and, and get back to uh, feeling normal. And then, of course, the other thing that we have talked about is, is the workload. How much work have you done before it's time to go to sleep again? So if, if you're having a relaxing day with the family or friends, that's not fatiguing. But if it's a busy day with a lot of activities, that's certainly going to be a significant uh, cause. And then there's some physiological things, things that we may not think about, things like dehydration or being hungry or being hypoxic. We often tell uh, pilots, particularly us older pilots, you know, when you fly at night above 5,000 feet, oxygen is probably a good idea. Well, it's a good idea because it helps your vision, but it also seems to affect your alertness and ability to stay awake. So you don't want to get hypoxic. And then it goes without saying that any illness or medication you might be taking can also be a contributing factor. And the, the aviation medical examiners, the AMEs, tell us that one of the big cautions that they have to alert pilots to are medications that contain the medication Benadryl, or the generic name is uh, diphenhydramine. That's in a lot of medications for, for allergy or cough or sinus, but that medication is very sedating. And we have to be careful, and every pilot should do the I'm safe checklist before they fly. And of course, one of the items in I'm safe is medications. And, and those things can seriously contribute to our sleepiness or lack of wakefulness. So that's a kind of a laundry list, Max, of the things that we need to be aware of. I'm glad you brought up the medications. That's a topic that I'm going to be talking about in a, another episode here sometime soon. I have gotten into the habit of any time I've been uh, prescribed anything or any time you even pick up something over the counter, I always Google it and I'll Google it, you know, name of the, the drug, whatever it is, and then FAA flying. And almost always the first link is going to bring me up to an FAA website. And there I can read immediately, oh, there's a 48-hour waiting period after you take this or no, this is safe. There is no waiting period. And I just really want to encourage everybody to do that. We talked a number of episodes ago about how the NTSB found that fully 30% of all fatal accidents involve either prescription and over-the-counter medications or illegal drugs. And the vast majority of that was prescription and over-the-counter medications, people on illegal drugs, relatively small. And so I think that's a huge risk area for very careful pilots who are doing all the right things, and yet they don't give a second thought to it when they've been prescribed something. Yeah, the, the AMEs certainly know, and they have a list. But it, you, as you said, that you can go to the FAA website, and they have a list now called Pilot Meds, and it is a list of things that are safe to fly with and things you cannot fly with. And there's some surprises on that list. When I looked at that list for the first time, it was published about three years ago, you think, well, a drug like melatonin, which people take to help with sleep, you think, well, surely you can't take melatonin and fly, but actually you can because there's very little carryover effect. So if you take melatonin at night to go to, to sleep, you, you can fly with uh, the next morning without having any waiting period because mel melatonin doesn't have this carryover sedative effect, but many medications do. And it was very helpful that the uh, FAA published that list a few years ago, which everyone should consult. And if there's any question that they need, they need to ask. Uh, primary care physicians may know about these things. Pharmacists often know these things, so we can query the pharmacist. But if you can get access to your AME, and I know that's difficult sometimes because those people are very busy and in short supply, but the AME can also help answer questions about, can I safely fly with this medication? And does it cause fatigue or sleepiness, which is very, very important. Yeah, or impaired judgment. So let's talk about uh, social and behavior issues. You had mentioned that these also contribute to fatigue. Yeah, so things like family stress or job stress, concern over employment or, or family concerns, an illness in the family or a disagreement with a spouse or work concerns, all of those things can be fatiguing and can weigh on our minds 
and can contribute uh, to this whole fatigue syndrome with impaired judgment and alertness. And if we're distracted and we, we are concerned about things that are going on outside our aviation life, that can be a cause of fatigue. You know, being uncomfortable or unfamiliar with a, a setting or surroundings. And, and also uh, things that we might not think about, excessive use of stimulants or suppressants. Uh, so people that drink a lot of coffee or drink too much alcohol, those things can, can affect our fatigue and alertness. But I think it's important to remember that if there are stresses in our lives, and we all, we all have them, those stresses can contribute to fatigue and might be something that we, we need to be aware of. Yeah, and you mentioned alcohol. I think a lot of people think, oh, alcohol, it's going to help me sleep. I don't know about your experience, but my experience has been the exact opposite of it. And I value sleep so much that I almost never take a, a drink of any kind because I, I get more enjoyment out of sleeping than being awake in the middle of the night because I had fun and had a drink earlier. Yeah, a clinical psychologist explained that to me a few years ago. She said, well, initially alcohol is sedating, but then it actually causes you, as you say, to, to wake up and be sort of hyper alert. And it can really interrupt uh, sleep cycles. And it's, it's a very important thing to be aware of. Hmm. So what are some of the symptoms? What can we detect uh, that might tell us that, hey, maybe we're sleepier and drowsier than we thought? Well, one of the obvious things is, that, you know, you just feel sleepy. You think, oh, my gosh, I got to lie down. I, I got to take a nap. Or where you have difficulty uh, concentrating, your mind wanders and you, you don't pay attention. And we did mention earlier this, this whole phenomenon of, of being willing to take increased risks because we don't perceive that something is a risk or that the danger associated with that risk is less than we might believe. And then you might become apathetic. You might become, you know, the, the things don't matter or that doesn't bother me or I don't care about this or feel kind of alone or isolated easily annoyed, you know, you sort of snap at people or, or lose your temper. And your reaction to certain stimuli, things that you would see, like I, I was in my airplane giving a, a student a ride and there were deer on the side of the runway. And fortunately, it was in the morning and we were quite alert. But I thought, well, imagine if those deer had been over there and it was a nighttime flight and they dashed in front of me, maybe I, I wouldn't have been as aware or as quick to respond to a deer crossing the runway. So our ability, the quickness, the, the speed at which we can respond to stimuli or react, or just be aware, be, be vigilant. We're less vigilant when we're fatigued and, and we forget things. And you, you can start to see yourself, if you're fatigued in the cockpit, say, well, what was that four-digit transponder code they just gave me? Or what altitude did they ask me to go to? Or what was the heading? And you start to forget simple things that you've done hundreds of times. Or the last thing is perhaps this notion of not being able to switch uh, tasks. You know, imagine flying an instrument approach where you're given a heading to intercept the final approach course and descend to a final altitude and then switch frequencies to go to the tower and report the final fix inbound. You know, you're giving all that. Well, you may not be able to process a complex series of instructions like that when you're fatigued. And if you see yourself saying, oh my gosh, I've done this a hundred times and now, what was it he said about, what was the heading, the altitude, the, the frequency, what I'm supposed to do for, I can only remember two of the four things he said, I'm going to have to ask him again. So those kinds of loss of ability to either fixate on one thing or not being aware of the other requirements or things that are coming at us, the stimuli we're receiving, that's a symptom that we may be fatigued and not as aware and as alert as we should be. Yes, I think so, uh, taking note of making multiple mistakes during a flight probably would be one thing that might cause us just to stop for a moment and think, hmm, maybe I am more tired than I thought I was, and maybe I should consider uh, changing my plan in some way. Maybe I'll stop early and not fly as long as I was going to today, or maybe I'll divert to the VFR airport instead of making this tricky IFR approach when apparently I'm making lots of mistakes and that wouldn't be the, the time to make mistakes. Now, I'm, I'm curious, you said that it's hard for us to assess when we're tired. Does it make sense for other people to ask us questions like, hey, how are you feeling? Or pointing out, hey, you're starting to look a little tired. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very reasonable thing. And uh, 
you know, our spouses can help with that, our work colleagues, uh, uh, flight instructors, people at the airport. It's kind of like the things our mothers used to tell us, you know, uh, Victor, you need your rest. You know, those, those kind of voices should be talking to us and reminding us that, yes, we don't do well when we're sleep deprived or we're tired or we're overly taxed with emotion or uh, deadlines or responsibilities. I, I think all of those things. But yes, having other people assess whether we're up to the task and whether we're fit for duty, so to speak. And I, I often say in my talks uh, to other pilots that the airlines have uh, corporate medical officers and, and the, uh, the military has flight surgeons uh, that can uh, assess uh, a pilot's fitness for duty. But we general aviation pilots uh, have that responsibility ourselves. And if we don't feel that we're up to the test, then I think your suggestion, Max, of having someone else help us assess our fitness for duty, if you will, is a reasonable thing to do. Yeah, that's probably why our accident rate is higher in general aviation, because we do have to do all of this self-assessment. I did tell a CFI earlier this year, a colleague, hey, you really should uh, consider all the activities you're trying to pack in here because you're starting to look a little stressed. You may get fatigued. And he was a relatively new to the CFI game. And I, I hope he appreciated it. And I think he did that somebody cared enough just to say, hey, you know, don't run yourself ragged uh, doing this. Now, I also had a CFI who would frequently ask me, you feeling good? You feel okay? You feeling good? And I was just thinking about that. And I realized I think people have a tendency to answer questions in the affirmative. So it would be pretty easy for me just to say, oh, yeah, I'm feeling good. But I'm thinking a better question might be, how are you feeling or are you feeling tired? So I'd like to just throw that out as ideas that uh, pilots should consider asking other pilots when they observe uh, behavior where they're starting to wonder, hey, is this person really operating at 100 percent? Yeah, you know, some of that is is kind of a form of expectation bias. You know, none of us wants to disappoint somebody or or, or admit that maybe we're we're not up to the task. So we we do those offhanded answers. Oh yeah, I'm good. I'm fine. Yeah, things are okay when when they're really not. So we need to make sure that we're remaining honest with ourselves. And when somebody asks us if they've been prompted to ask us if we're doing okay and feeling all right. There's probably a reason they did that, because we must be showing them some signs or indication that maybe we're, we're not doing all right. Yeah, I think that pilots could just you know, extend themselves a little bit more to other pilots and other CFIs and show that we care and, and ask these questions from time to time. Well, one of the big ways that fatigue gets managed, if you will, in the professional aviation world is through flight and duty limitations and rest requirements. Talk about the regulations for that. Yeah, you know, there's something that probably all of us GA pilots uh, ought to be familiar with, and that's uh, the Federal Aviation Regulation uh, 117. That FAR contains a number of regulations that came out of that Colgan aircraft crash in New York several years ago, where it was pretty clear, although the NTSB didn't definitively say that there was fatigue involved, many of the NTSB members said that it, their impression was that fatigue was involved. So out of that unfortunate crash where there were many fatalities came this Regulation 117. And, and it has a lot of guidelines that are illustrative and helpful to even us GA pilots about, they refer to things like duty hours and shift changes and so forth. But much of that applies to us because of, you know, our usual uh, daily responsibilities uh, in our in our jobs to our families or whatever it might be, and it deserves some reading. And I would recommend that all pilots look at FAR 117 and look at the guidelines and regulations that are set down for professional air crews, because I think those guidelines can be helpful to us in, in avoiding fatigue and the consequences. You were talking briefly about shift work. Tell us about your experience in the medical world. What you've learned from shift workers and uh, in-house medical staff and how fatigue affects them and ways to deal with that. So uh, I'll tell you a personal story and then, uh, then I'll tell you what medical education did to, to address what was identified as a real problem. So when, when I was an intern, back when dinosaurs walked the earth, um, we had to um, work 12-hour shifts in the emergency room. And you can imagine some of those shifts could be very, very demanding. They, they, we, we saw some very, very ill people and if you were just working 12-hour shifts from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day, 
that would have been demanding enough. But what we did was we did that for six days. And then on day seven, we didn't work from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., but we were asked to come in to start the next six days at 7 p.m. that next day. And then we would work 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. for six days, go home at the end of that 7 a.m. end of work shift, and sleep most of that seventh day, and then go back to days. So then report for work at 7 a.m. and work till 7 p.m. and do that for six days. Well, what we learned was that is one of the worst conditions you can possibly do is shifting from day work to night work and back and forth. If you work nights and all you work is nights, then your circadian rhythms readjust and you sleep during the day and all is well. But shifting back and forth from days to nights is very demanding. And some professional aircraft crews do just that. They'll fly a night flight and then maybe a few days they'll fly a day flight. And if there's not enough time to recover and readjust those rhythms, that can induce significant fatigue. Well, the medical profession, sometime in the 1980s or early 1990s, started to examine the performance of house officers, that is, uh, medical residents and interns who are responsible for the coverage of patients in the hospital, you know, 24-7. And what they learned, not surprisingly, was that house officers that were working long shifts, there were times when I would start work at 8 a.m. one morning and work till 4 p.m. the following day. So I would work well past 30 hours or so. And when they evaluated the performance of house officers who work those kinds of long, demanding schedules, not surprisingly, they found that we made errors. And those errors were sometimes very harmful to patients. So about 20 years ago or so, the committees that control graduate medical education in the U.S. said, well, we're not going to do that anymore. And if a house officer, even a young person, these people are in their late 20s, early 30s, if they work 24 hours, they must go home. They cannot work longer than 24 hours. And, you know, when I was 26 or 27 and an intern, I could work 24 hours. It was pretty doable. Working 30 hours was tough and it was very demanding. I can tell you now, if I work 12 or 14 hours, I'm thoroughly exhausted. So the older we get, the less tolerant we become of those fatiguing situations, but we need to be very, very aware of the fact that much research has shown that sleep-deprived people, whether they're physicians or someone else, we make mistakes when we're fatigued, and those mistakes in the cockpit can be fatal. Yeah, and I think in some ways there might be a parallel between the the medical system where uh, they've used in the past low-cost labor, you know, used to be called interns, <laughs> now called residents. And I think in the flight world, we have CFIs who are being tasked with doing a lot of long hours, again, at low compensation. And in both cases, because there's a, a good payoff, a good reward that they're looking forward to uh, years down the road. Any thoughts on structuring uh, the system's in flight schools or the flight training industry, you know, based on your knowledge of what's been done in the medical world to kind of uh, you know, improve the, the system? Well, part of that is imposed by the, the federal regulations, which are, which are thoughtful uh, about the limitation of the number of hours that a flight instructor can instruct during the day. But th there are, to my knowledge, and correct me if I'm wrong, Max, uh, limitations on how much flying a student could do. I mean, theoretically, a student could fly for several hours during the day, he could fly with several different instructors, and then he could continue or she could continue to fly in the evening. And I think we have to be aware that not only are those limitations important for people who instruct, but they're also important for people who are learning. And um, learning to fly is, at one level, an exhausting experience. I mean, and I can tell you that having sat in classrooms for many, many hours over many, many years as a student or a learner, that could be exhausting. So, I think we need to caution CFIs and student pilots, learner pilots, that there should be a limit. And eight hours is a reasonable limit for both learning and it's already in the regulations uh, for teaching. And then over extended periods of time, a week or so, there are also limitations put on how many hours a, 
a flight instructor can teach in, in a week or so. So I think we need to be aware of those things and not underestimate the risk. Now, I realize that the risk to a 20 or 25 year old are different than the risk to a 55 or 65 year old uh, flight instructor, but it's still important that we put limits and realize that any kind of mental or physical exertion is going to have an impact and, and make us fatigue. Yeah, the interesting thing is I think the rules specify a maximum of eight hours per day for a CFI to be teaching in the air, and yet you might be at the flight school 14 hours slowly accumulating uh, those eight hours in you know, one hour and 1.5 hour increments with lots of pre-flight time and ground time that uh, doesn't count to that. So I think that's something for people to keep in mind. So what do we do to mitigate fatigue? Well, there's a number of things we can do. And uh, again, it's, it's back to what our mothers told us, you know, get adequate rest, Ma- make sure you're sleeping. And the, the people that study this, and there are physicians who are experts on the physiology of sleep, they say we ought to have regular sleep times. We ought to go to bed about the same time every night. We ought to sleep for about the same number of hours. And this also comes into play, particularly for us pilots, when we're, we go off and, and we're staying in, in hotels or conference centers or whatever. We should make sure that we take with us whatever we require to sleep well, whether it's our favorite pillow or making sure you have the adequate blanket. If you've got a condition like sleep apnea, make sure you take your CPAP machine with you and, and get adequate sleep when you're on the road. Continue to exercise. Sedentary activity or inactivity is not conducive to, to good sleeping. And as we said earlier, uh, avoid alcohol and, and caffeine. We haven't mentioned things like, should be obvious, but things like CBD. There are many uh, forms now of cannabidiol in all sorts of preparations that are touted for health maintenance. And there are many states in the U.S. now where CBD is legal. We need not say too much about the illegal use of marijuana, which of course is prohibited, but all of those things obviously should be avoided. And we should also remember to eat on some sort of regular schedule because starvation can impact fatigue and and, and make it worse. So eat well, exercise, get get adequate sleep. Um, Again, these are the things our mothers told us, and they still hold true whether you're a teenager or, or, or somebody in, in middle or later years. So all of those things are, are things that can help us to manage fatigue. All right. So it turns out that mom did know best. And now that we're no longer teenagers, we can actually listen to her and follow what, what she suggested. So you had mentioned to me something about sleep inertia, which I really wasn't familiar with. Tell us about that. So sleep inertia is this temporary disorientation that we have mentally or a decline in performance or a mood after we wake up from sleep. You know, it's sort of that as soon as you're awake from sleep, you have that sort of I'm not fully awake sensation. It makes you feel groggy. And during that period of time, that those first minutes or hours or so after you wake up, you have slower reaction time. You have decreased short-term memory. You have decreased thinking speed. And your ability to reason, remember, and learn things is impaired. So the message here is that because of this sleep, and remember, inertia in physics is if a body is in motion, it tends to stay in motion. If a body is at rest, it tends to stay at rest. So sleep inertia is kind of like, well, we're sort of still in that sleep-like state. So we had said earlier, well, you could take a nap and that might revitalize you, but it would be a bad idea to take a nap and then get up and five minutes later, initiate a flight. You need to have a period of time where you kind of wake up and you wake up your body systems. And, and that's really what sleep inertia is all about, this, this sort of remaining in this sleep-like state. And so you have to give yourself adequate time to fully wake up. I think that's what many of us do in the morning with that first cup of coffee. And you might not need the coffee. It's just the time you need to, to come out of that sleepfulness into a wakefulness. So that, that's what sleep inertia is, something to be aware of. Interesting. 
yeah, I can imagine if we're at home, it's not that big of an issue because we've got the the morning rituals we get up of you know brushing your teeth and showering or whatever it may be it gives you plenty of time to get through that. But I guess the big issue is if you're sitting in an FBO in a crew rest room and you're fully dressed and they say, hey, the passengers are here, boom, that's probably not the time to kind of see, see how fast you could get that airplane off the ground. Yeah. Waking up from a nap in the crew restroom and then jumping in the airplane and getting ready to go, it, it would raise some cautions. And it, you may not be fully alert in those first 20 or 30 minutes after waking from a nap in the crew restroom. Hmm. I understand that you have what everybody is looking for, which is the the simple, easy way to solve all of these problems. So what do we do to reduce or reverse sleepiness? Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> there, really, there really is no magical solution. The best solution for fatigue is sleep. And there's really nothing that replaces sleep. Caffeine won't do it. Medications won't do it. When you're tired, sleep is the remedy. It's the prescription that I would advise as a physician. Sleepiness and fatigue is corrected with sleep. Yeah. And I got to say that I have, for much of my life, was not a great practitioner of sleep. I've always been a night owl. Just that's the time where I kind of find myself engaged in projects. It was easy to, you know, get to bed too late and then have to get up in the morning. And I think I spent uh, way too many days, weeks, or years just not at my top performance because of that. But I got to tell you, in recent years, I have become a, a disciple of sleep. I love it. It feels great. And uh, anyway, I, I'm using your your magic potion and it's working. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. You know, as a younger man, I used to love the late night hours and I, I would read and write from 10 p.m. to midnight. Now I find as an elder that my best hours are in, in the early morning, I get up. 5.36 in the morning, wake up for a half hour, an hour. And then those early morning hours, like between 7 and 10, are very productive times. And that, that I think, is a change that many of us experience as we age, that morning wakefulness is one of our most productive times. And that's why for most of my flights, I like to fly relatively early in the morning. I mean, not crack of dawn early in the morning, but 8, 9 a.m., great time to start, very alert, very awake, very well-rested. And the caution time is that those hours between, say, five and eight in the evening, you can be very, very careful about that. Well, the nice thing about those morning flights, hardly any turbulence. And not much traffic. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thank you so very much. You've given us a prescription for a lot of things to do right in life. <laughs> thanks so much for your help today. Well, thanks for having me again, Max. It was a pleasure. <laughs> And my thanks to Dr. Victor Vogel for joining us again here today. I've included links in the show notes to the Susquehanna STEM to the Skies project that he works with and to the National Association of Flight Instructors. And just a reminder that I love hearing from you and I read many of your emails on the show. If you'd like to send me a message, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contact at the top of the page. That's absolutely the best way to send me a message. And of course, I also want to thank everyone who supports the show in one of the following ways. We love it when you join the club and sign up at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome to support the show financially. You can also do that at aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. We also love it when you leave a five-star review on whatever app that you're listening to us on now. But most importantly, please tell one or more of your friends about the show. That's the primary way that we grow the show. So please let your friends know about Aviation News Talk. And of course, if you're in the market for a headset, please consider buying a Lightspeed headset and using one of the links in our show notes, because if you use those links, they will donate to help support the show. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. And remember that you can always go around. You can always go around. If it don't look right, come down. Don't wait until your side's baby sliding upside down.